Hey there, everyone. This is JSA TV and JSA Podcast, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Jamie Scott Okataya, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, welcome to our February JSA Virtual Roundtable. Part of our monthly broadcast, we've been honored to host for several years now, but new for 2020, we are providing the first 100 registrants with lunch on JSA. So thank you for joining us and, and hope you enjoy your lunch. We're also excited to say folks are hungry for quality content. We have nearly 130 registrants tuning in live today. So thank you everyone for joining and in true roundtable style, we want to hear from you. If you have questions for our amazing panelists, please go ahead and type them into our little question box. And if we have time at the end, we'll be sure to post a few, uh, pose a few questions to our panel. Also, if you have a speaker suggestion for next time or to check out our upcoming monthly topics, speakers, or to just register for more roundtables coming up uh, down the pike, please go ahead and check out our brand new site, jsa.net. All right, let's get started. Today's topic, MicroEdge. Where is it and where is it heading? We have an all-star C-level lineup from four absolutely innovative companies joining us today. And to help us introduce them and to guest moderate our panel, please welcome back my friend Jerry Christensen, he is the founder, CEO, and principal of Mind Commerce, one of our industry's top research consulting and advisory companies focused exclusively on the TNT. Jerry, the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you, Jane. I appreciate the introduction. And so as part of our research practice and consulting, we cover edge and related areas like 5G. I'm very pleased to uh, have the panelists introduce themselves next and we're going to jump right to that. So Philip, why don't we start with you? Just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your company. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jamie, for hosting. Uh, again, great to be a part of your uh, your series here. Uh, Philip Marangella, the CMO at Edge Connects. Um, Edge Connects is a um, wholesale data center provider um, we kind of span the spectrum, not just for the edge, but everything hyper local to hyper scale is how we like to say it. And we often get asked, how do we define the edge? It really isn't us, it's our customers. So wherever our customers need to go, we will build it in terms of the size, in terms of the location, exactly to their parameters so they can best get their deployments as close to their end users and customers as possible. So with that, we have over 40 data centers and over 30 markets in North America, Europe, and South America today. All right, Greg, you're up next. Ah, good afternoon, and thanks, Jamie. I went with the Jason's Deli option and, <clears throat> and arrived about 10 minutes ago, so I'll try to wait till after we're done here to dive into that. Uh, Greg Patin co-founder of Edge Micro. We're an early stage company offering uh, Edge services, specifically co-location at the Edge. All right, great. Doug, how about you? Yes, Doug Recker, I'm the founder of Edge Presence. We deploy micro data centers, build and deploy micro data centers throughout the country, um, strictly for colo neutral uh, housing of servers, just like Greg's doing. And probably the majority of the panel. Fantastic. You, you're uh, last but not least. Cool, thank you. Uh, Hugh Karspeck, and CEO of uh, Dart Points, uh, MicroEdge data center uh, owner and operator. Uh, we've been operating since 2012. Um, uh, first deployments come online uh, back in 2013. Um, and we are uh, very excited to be in this space and kind of help growing it with, uh, with my co-panelists. All right, fantastic. Well, let's just jump right into it. We've got a list of prepared questions, but again, as Jamie said, we're definitely gonna be taking some questions from viewers and participants, and we'll get to those too, hopefully quite a few of those. So the first question we're gonna go with, and this is a question that we hear a lot about, is what are the leading apps for Edge, both on the consumer side and the business side? So apps or services, and, and I, I'm hearing you guys say uh, that uh, the deployments are driven by your your customers. So I guess really the question there might be, what are your customers deploying in, in terms of applications? All right. So I'll, I'll start just to get things rolling. Um, you know, it's funny. So in terms of the edge and the discussions we're having today, um, you know, now edge is so fashionable and in vogue, right? And we've been doing this 
for many years now, long before uh, edge was was the hot topic, right? And I think the first way for us, for our customers, was really about getting the content closer to the eyeballs, right? Serving a market like Phoenix out of a the one Wilshire building in LA just wasn't uh, cost effective. It wasn't performance and latency sensitive. Um, uh, effective either right and so that's what drove customers asking us to deploy these edge uh, data centers in a lot of the tier two tier three uh, markets across the United States that's phase one phase two cloud right same notion but for the enterprises putting the workloads in uh, the infrastructure closer to where the enterprises are serving a market out of Portland locally rather than asking customers to come up to Seattle or down to Santa Clara was key and then the next wave, obviously, of things like IoT, autonomous vehicles, VR, AR, and so forth and so on, that are really kind of driving a much more distributed architecture going beyond um, the uh, current data center deployments throughout the United States and beyond. Okay. Yeah, Jim, I, I've got a really good case study that we just deployed. Really interesting. And, and we're learning a lot as we go to, right? So we're seeing customers asking to do certain things that we didn't think about. So prime example, we just deployed a couple of micro DCs along the railway. And what they're doing with these micro DCs is they built a, basically a shelter that these trains fly through about 60 miles an hour and hundreds of cameras. And it's analyzing everything on the train from the bolts, if there's a loose bolt or if there's somebody actually on the train, it, it analyzes all this. So six miles out before it hits the yard, so it's like in Waycross, Georgia, they have a huge yard there. They know before it hits the yard, which train or which which uh, device needs to be taken offline and fixed instead of having the 30 people they have now walk up and down and inspect them. It's very dangerous, it's time consuming. So that data needs to compute and needs to, to catch really at that site there. So you're in the middle of nowhere basically. So they don't have a, the, the, the ability to bring a big pipe to transfer this data back to their data center in, in Atlanta or even Jacksonville. So what they're doing is they're computing right there and shooting it right back to the yard six miles up. That's a perfect case study of what we're seeing uh, in the industry and also with uh, transportation. We have another customer that's looking at doing the same thing, but on site at all their distribution facilities. So we're, we're kind of learning a lot as we go here. It's, it's, it's evolving every day. And I was at a customer yesterday, it's a new case study. So it's really, it's really neat and it's, it's cool to see how this is all evolving. That's great, Doug, and that, that seems like an extreme example, catching the imaging right there. And is there any real-time aspect to that, or are they just catching it and then maybe uh, backhauling it at some point? No, there's real-time, actually, on that. So, yeah, and they're, they're using two different technologies right now, and one is uh, they're using 4G. They're using a point-to-point, -point, wireless point-to-point, -point, and they're also using LAN. So they can build out a small pipe to that site, and they can, they can basically pick the data they want to send, right? They can go through it. And analyze which data they want to send in cache and re immediately repeat back to the station. Perfect, perfect. You uh, would you like to weigh on this question as well? Absolutely. I I, <clears throat> I think Doug is 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 bringing something quite um, significant uh, to that conversation, which is there's a lot of opinions on edge and who are the users and and what are these applications and we're all uh, very um, Silicon Valley fixated on you know our Netflix and things like that and, and content delivery. That's fantastic. Um, but um, there are many, many different use cases um, uh, of this. Uh, Doug bringing up uh, the railroad, for example, um, the, uh, that have been out there for many, many years. Uh, and it's, it, it's interesting, I've given this example before, but uh, you know, we talk about autonomous driving vehicles, but people don't realize that John Deere has been doing this for, for 12 years, 15 years. Um, and so these are things uh, that are very necessary uh, uh, we've calculated up to now there's about 40 to 50 new types of industries that are um, uh, not just using the data, consuming the data, but actually creating their own data and they're having an influence on this data. So, for example, um, as we engage uh, in some of the rural areas on, on, on these new systems that are going out there, we've got new customers like the insurance companies that are starting to weigh in on, on what's being done. Um, and um, it, it's uh, so these applications can range from very simple, very telecom access interconnection. That's fine. Um, there's those that are actually um, uh, we have um, uh, a site. Well, first of all, it, one thing that is a little bit unique about dark points relative to the others um, is that we we've deployed in almost all forms of real estate, um, high rises, greenfields, parking lots, 
garages. We started with um, uh, trying to, believe it or not, um, uh, build units in times of, in, inside of storage facilities, um, which was um, came to a disastrous end. Um, but um, there are, uh, the reasons for that is because you're, there's the power, there's the telecom, and, um, and it's, uh, to Philip's point, it's, it's pushing out towards where the customers are and where they require it. Um, and uh, so the, one application, obviously we're hosting a very large uh, hotel company. Um, uh, we tend to talk to the ecosystem. So each of these users um, buy it and consume it in very different ways. And uh, other people come in and, and, and consume those that are in the data center. So it creates a, a marketplace and ecosystem well, this large hotel um, uh, came in using the data center. That's fantastic. Um, then all, all of a sudden, you recognize that all the CDNs were showing up. Why? Because they're all vendors to the hotel. Um, and then at that point, some of the cloud operators started coming in because obviously all those services sit on top of those cloud, that cloud infrastructure. So you see a lot of use cases that are not um, uh, very uh, specific to applications that are in the headlines today. Very good. Greg, how about you? I, yeah, I, I think that... You know, first you have to define where the edge is. I think that certainly uh, Edge connects their model uh, originally to build their edge data centers, you know, the one to two megawatt really servicing the, the MSOs, the cable goes. And then, you know, they've certainly gone a, a, a slightly larger direction, but also with their eye on, on getting a little further out than their 38 edge data centers. We are focused on the, what we would call the far edge. And, and that is you know, underserved markets, could be NFL cities, but certainly not around the tier one peering cities of New York, Ashburn, Dallas, and, and, the, and the seven other tier one markets. I, I think with the far edge, when you talk about what use cases are gonna drive it, uh, in this case, I think the infrastructure is going to drive the use cases. I, I think this is about the network effect, and unless and, and, and we and the other uh, companies on this panel can get scale out there fairly quickly, and, and by scale, I mean 30, 50, or 100 nodes, this isn't interesting to anyone. Uh, it is only interesting when you can get to that uh, inflection point where you really, uh, the network effect takes place. So I, I think once that infrastructure is out there, a lot of smart people will figure out how to, how to utilize it. Right now though, obviously we've got to have people paying the bills so we can close money and, and, and start to scale this thing. Uh, the initial use cases that we're actually having people pay us for uh, are basically around video delivery. And that could be the CDNs specifically, could be the hyperscalers looking to get some of their applications, whether that's collaboration tools, cloud gaming, don't know. And they don't know in many cases, they're trying to test this to figure out, you know, how do they re-architect this third wave of the internet to prevent the tromboning and hairpinning that goes on in these metros and be able to deliver, you know, less than a 10 millisecond consistent performance. And, and performance obviously is, is not just based on latency, it's based on jitter, uh, being able to uh, bring that content, you know, closer to that endpoint uh, and, and provide less packet variability and thus less jitter. It's bandwidth, the ability to bring more volume closer to the user, uh, regardless of what the upstream limitation is. It's availability, diversity, security, obviously. So uh, performance applications right now that customers are willing to pay us for are, are based around just that, uh, better performance and, and getting this thing at its scale. Can I, Those were all great answers and great dialogue. Hey, Jerry. So, and I'd like to kind of piggyback on what Greg was saying with respect to the uh, the network effect. Jerry, I, I think Philip is, uh, is speaking, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Philip. Uh, yeah, no, I, and maybe I was going where you were gonna to, to follow on, Jerry, around the network effect, and I think Greg makes a great point, right? I, you know, for all of us, what, you know, what I see us trying to solve, right, is, 
is a, a lot of the, the, the elements that, that Greg was talking about, this re-architecting the internet, because there's so much, the volume of data, the velocity requirements of data and that variety, right? And the different folks, whether, you know, Doug, in your use case with the train, right? Hey, the train uh, service, the, the train company wants it, the cloud company, and it's, it's it, you know, historically, the network traffic flows have always been download centric. But now so much data is being created at the edge. It's creating these bottlenecks at the edge to try to, you know, as you capture this, some of it stays at the edge, goes to other edges, or back to the core to 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 uh, to capture and analyze. And so now it's becoming multi-directional. And this is where the peering um, at the edge and having data centers, you know, whether they're edge or micro edge, are so important to smartly route that traffic and alleviate the bottlenecks that are arising and being created because there's so much, whether it's the device, whether it's the car, wh whatever it may be, this is the key role that we as a collective are trying to solve so that um, you, know, you, 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 you don't have any of an impediments to the, the next generation of technologies that are rolling out. That's great, uh, Philip. And I, actually, I was gonna go to you next, but that was a great answer. Um, I was like to add on to that to say, uh, it seems like this, whole edge rollout thing is going to be very iterative in the sense of what Philip and Greg just said, that there is going to be a need to focus on what infrastructure is there to determine what we can do. So today it may be a lot about video, it may be a lot about CDNs and optimization for apps and services that we already have, making them better. Uh, so getting into our next question, which has to do with how is this all going to be deployed, I'd love to hear from you guys your thoughts about are there any differences in terms of a carrier deployment and what they might do, uh, what's driving that, what apps and services and what they might use it for versus some of the private networks? And when I say private networks, it could be any type of enterprise or industrial customer or maybe even a government customer. So I, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about that. Are you seeing any differences there? Can we characterize that or generalize that? Uh, so you, how about we go with you first? Great. <clears throat> There are <clears throat> very um, different use cases. Um, now, the good news is that everybody kind of backs into it together uh, at, at a mature site. Um, uh, when we started off, um, we've, we've made a lot of assumptions, and many of those assumptions were wrong. Um, many of these assumptions are still out there in the marketplace um, that people will also learn their own lessons on. Um, but as you approach, a lot of people are very fixated, depending on which industries you come from, as to who your customers are and how are you developing. Um, going strictly after a carrier mindset, uh, carrier customer, um, they're gonna have a, a, a different deployment process. If you go after just enterprise, you're gonna have a different type of process. You'll also have different types of uh, profitability based on those types of models, and you have to balance those um, uh, and you also need to you need to understand uh, we've all seen that paradigm that that cliche picture of the small fish followed by a bigger fish and so on and so forth. Um, you need to understand who your customer is within that pecking order. Um, your first one. Um, uh, there's a lot of talk about anchor tenants. That's great, but if that anchor tenant can't feed, that anchor tenant's not going to be an anchor tenant for very long. Um, and those are things that are really hard lessons uh, to learn. Um, what's also interesting is uh, how these are deployed and what's starting to come down the pipe. Um, uh, some of our customers are starting, to, and this is a cautionary tale to everyone um, listening, um, we're seeing technology that is, we will be deploying in some proof of concepts here, um, that are actually changing the way some of these data centers are built, um, and uh, which is great, it's good for me, lowers my costs, um, but it also, uh, uh, it adjusts um, how these are, are, are being used. And so um, now what that does is that does open up a, a totally different avenue of customers to consume the space, whether it's for five minutes, 15 minutes, or, or several years. Um, but it's a, um, uh, this is a very, um, it's very, this is not just a kind of a data center take two or data center take three. Um, this is a new type of, of, of evolution, if you will. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's a lot of folks that are influenced in it. All right. Greg, what do you think? Go ahead, Doug. Well, I, you know, everybody on this panel has built 
data centers, right? We've built brick and mortar data centers. What what I see out there right now, we go into primary tier three markets. We have deployed some in what I call a type two market, but the real need I think is is the type type three market. And the 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 centers, the micro DCs that you're building, right, are gonna. I'm not really worried about the Verizon building the same unit that I'm building because I built my data centers based on carrier neutral, and I think you're going to find that in these markets as well. I look at the tier three markets. You know, back when I first built my first one in 2009, I always wanted to build one in the tier three market because they need access there, they need connectivity, but it doesn't make sense to build a 12 million dollar brick and mortar there. It doesn't it won't work, right? So they they still need that facility there that is a a, a neutral facility. So I, I really think just getting back to what they're they're going to look like the carriers and and what we're going to look like is a carrier neutral just you know just a smaller brick and mortar data center and they're going to need that then then you build the ecosystem out you build the peering point out you build all that and hopefully hopefully the carriers will come and they want to co-locate in there to capture the customer there and capture that that market it's easier for them to co-locate now they have an instant presence in that market. That's what so, I Doug, think. are you saying, and and uh, and I would ask everybody to see if this resonates with everybody, that there's, well, first of all, there's definitely a need for carrier neutral um, micro DCs. I'm, I get that. But are we saying that that's going to be the predominant role uh, initially or overall? Or or another way of asking the question is, will there be a role for the carriers for deploying in a telco closet type of a thing at an enterprise and, and not being a carrier managed service? You know, those facilities still need to be built out, they, even if they have a, a, an existing old shelter there, they still need to build those. I think everybody on this panel knows that we're more agile. We can move quicker than they can. Um, I I foresee them taking space in a lot of our facilities because they don't have to put the CapEx and they don't have to, to, it'll take them a long time. That's what I see. Guys, I mean, I, I don't know what you're thinking, but that's that's what Anybody I see. Anybody else want to do that? Oh no, no question though. And when you say carriers, obviously, are you are you? There's terrestrial, there's wireless, well, there's well, ISPs. Well, what, right. No, I'm asking Jerry what, what specifically when he defined define carrier. Well, you can answer from any of the above because uh, I, I should say communication service provider. Perhaps that's more all encompassing. But when I say carriers, I do think of the Verizons and the AT and Ts of the world. Though. Okay. That well, they're 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 too big. They're too slow. They can't scale this. Uh, they've proven it in the past, and they're trying to do a walled garden approach, just like CenturyLink. And uh, I think eventually our customers collectively here are going to put pressure on the telcos. Those three specifically. Uh, when we prove we can scale, they're going to put pressure on them to start sharing infrastructure, potentially even allowing installs in their parking lots of those central offices because trying to convert a NEBS compliant central office into a uh, edge data center with the IT kits that the hyperscalers are very customized is very difficult. So um, if we're talking about the terrestrial carriers, uh, then, uh, you know, I think it's going to prove out, yes, they can build the medium uh, edge sites, but when you're starting to talk about far edge and really scaling it, I, I think they're going to struggle. All right, well, that might be a good segue for the next question, which is just how distributed and just how small does this all get? I mean, we've heard some pretty good examples of how it can get really small maybe it's very use case specific like the train example I, you know i need to have it right there where the train goes by uh so i can capture the optics um do we have any other use cases we can talk about about how small it can get or can we generalize you know will there be lots of regional data centers only or are we expecting there to be edge deployed in pretty much every telco closet even in small medium-sized businesses perhaps who would like to take that first well, so I'll, I'll start, right? So look, I think um, it will run the gamut as I kind of alluded to before, right? And and they'll just continue to push out further afield, far edge and, and, and beyond. Um, and it will adjust in size and scale and so forth, but it's, it's not mutually exclusive. It doesn't mean the core goes away. It doesn't mean I live in Ashburn, I drive through the gauntlet of 
Gajanga data centers every day. Um, that will continue to, to grow um, as those data lakes are required to, to capture and analyze all the data that's being created at the edge. But at the same time, as I was talking about, those, those um, kind of edge peering data centers that are going to have to capture all that data um, in a, a city, on a farm, in a you know high rise building we're going to have to be established and they have to interoperate right and so we have to work as a collective not unilaterally to try to solve this problem um together with the network service providers with the cloud service providers and the rest of the ecosystem right and um i think it's it's critical that you know the other aspect and i, I defer to the to my my fellow panelists there's also a lot of misconceptions about hey what it takes to run and operate efficiently and effectively a large data center versus a small data center is an important consideration, right? They have to be unmanned. You have to be able to operate these things remotely. You have to understand the security components and all that kind of stuff. These are a lot of uh, important considerations. The smaller you go, the smaller form factor that folks have to understand to uh, efficiently deploy these things out at the edge. All right. Who else would like to weigh in on that, Doug? Yeah, and just back up a little bit too. You know, we're we're deploying these in in cities and small towns, but you also need the certifications. We all know that. That's you know, you're not going to get any banking or healthcare. Or, you know, the customers that we're trying to go after the small community banks or the the local hospital that needs better connectivity in those markets, you're not going to be able to get those to co-locate in your facility without your certifications. I don't see the major carriers doing that if they do that's a heck of that's a long process we're we've been working on ours for the last six months just for jacksonville so i mean we're getting close but if you're if you manage to scale like that think about all those locations you're going to have to go through those auditing standards right so it's not just like like philip said deploying physically deploying them but maintaining them maintaining the certifications the access control who's going how to audit that so it's there's a lot to it there, there's a lot to it so it's i don't see a you know I don't see tons of carriers doing it. I think they'd rather take space in a certified facility, right, than deploy and, and go through that hassle themselves. That's just my opinion. I don't want to give Doug a, a big head on this because I'm going to agree with him again. Um, but Doug, you're absolutely right. Um, we, when Dartpoint started, uh, we were very fixated on what to build and how to build it. Uh, we learned very, very quickly that that was exactly the wrong thing to do. Um, so we started fixating on how to operate and how to go about what what is an what is a, a way to get um, SSA 18 well, today's SSA 18 right. uh, certified HIPAA PCI SACT things uh, sp specifically on the security access uh, and physical access um, these are extremely important um, it's a challenge um, uh, for example uh, the these auditing firms are not used to what we do. Um, so there's a lot of communication. Um, I think of myself less as a micro edge data center company and actually more of a digital logistics company. The questions I get from my customers are more about Q. How do I get my servers out to that location? That location does not have an address. That's a huge issue, okay? Um, and we've been working on that for many years with regards to how do you get your customers in a compliant way to ship hardware to locations that are in areas that are not necessarily addressable or with addresses. And how do you do this in a way that they feel secure about? Um, you certainly can't have boxes show up on the outside of a, uh, of a, of a modular building uh, sitting in the snow. Uh, that's not a good business uh, proposition. Um, it, it certainly happens. Um, but these are things that uh, need to be understood. A lot of people talk about automation. So think people are saying, hey, we're going to get this. And, and I, we jumped a little bit ahead here, but in terms of how distributed, if you if if you make a mistake in your architecture or your process, uh, and then you hit scale, you've scaled that mistake, and unwinding that mistake is a huge issue. And if you apply compliance to it, you've made a bigger issue. Um, and those are the things that we are looking to avoid uh, as we go out and build, um, and having being able to address, um, uh, there are some very large hyperscalers that need their fit out, especially as it gets distributed. So they talk about, uh, I'm gonna throw out numbers that are 
very hyperbolic, but these numbers are out there. You know, there's a thousand, two thousand, three thousand sites that some of these folks are looking at, all ultimately covering here in the United States over time, eight, ten years. Um, but they want a single pane of glass, so they want that rack to be the same number rack in the same location across the hundreds of places that you've got. That is a logistical issue. And those are things that you're trying to address and make sure that, hey, that hyperscaler who doesn't really like that hyperscaler, you have to kind of negotiate across the two. Uh, and anyone that has tried to negotiate power between the two, uh, the, the big internet players, um, those, are, those are serious challenges that as more distributed you get, and these will get more distributed. Uh, but to Philip's point, it will depend on the use case. Um, and just because you can place a box somewhere, it doesn't mean you should. All right, great. I, I think anyone, any of our uh, guests that are tuned in that may be considering getting into providing edge co-location services are starting to uh, second guess themselves because as as Hugh as stated, this is not for the faint of heart. Uh, this has never been done before, be, uh, scaling these types of services uh, with velocity that is required. The, the, uh, all of the learning aspects that Doug talked about, about you know, permitting and compliance, um, every state has different requirements for the actual prefabricated module. So, mm -hmm. Uh, you, you have to identify where that specific uh, module is going because the, you, the fabricator has to make certain uh, customizations, whether it's a door in Florida has to be flood proof or what have you. Uh, and, and it goes on and on. And, and, and Hugh just listed the, the beginning uh, when you start talking about uh, remote, as Philip said, remote monitoring these are lights out have to be lights out facilities and the logistics that doug talked about it is um this is this is tough stuff uh, i think we're all figuring it out uh through you know you got to fail fast uh you got to try a lot of different things and you got to fail fast and 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 keep and keep pushing but you, you, we have to have customers right we have to and when you start talking about what size are is are these deployments um you know you, you have to start looking when you start getting below x amount of racks it's it's really difficult to show any kind of internal rate of return on that so and you know to get investment when you start talking about well i'm going to start go deploy you know a single rack in 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 these facilities for this specific use case um that's it's tough to make a business out of that right so if you're talking less than six or eight racks uh driving monthly recurring revenue you know somewhere in the 10 to fifteen thousand dollars a month where a third of that is your operating expense and power uh, you know, regardless of what somebody might be wanting you to do, it, it, it may not make sense. You're giving our sequence away, Greg. Get down. <laughs> All right. So I think perhaps a good follow-up to that question then would have to do with managed services and more specifically managed computing, data, and application services. But before we even get to that, that would be an operational system. I'm hearing that there's a lot of issues that have to do with logistics, whether that's engineering and planning or siting issues, and of course the actual execution of that. So when I ask the question about managed services, think about it not only about getting something stood up and ready to go, but also the ongoing caring and feeding of it. So the question is, what is the role for managed services in edge computing, and how do you guys see your respective companies playing in that? Who would like to go first? Uh, I'll, I'll take I, I went last. I'll, I'll go first. For us, it's it's offering some uh, semblance of remote hands, uh, but pretty fairly simple. You know, we're not going to manage any of the IT stack. It's going to be a reboot. We can do most of that remotely. All of us, there's technology to do that. Uh, UPS replacement, obviously, you have to have somebody on site, uh, but most of the customers we're talking to and prospects, these are not mission critical applications that they're putting out at the far edge. These SLAs, at least for our 
prospects are not nearly as as tight as they would be in some of Phillips, uh, you know, edge data centers. Uh, so that's just the way it is. These are, you know, b- being able to mo- uh, manage and monitor these at scale, you can only do so much. So it's it's different model than than a normal regional co-location center. Yeah, they just. Add on what Greg is saying. For us, we had to, there wasn't anything off the shelf, right? To kind of remotely, you know, a lights out data center, um, you know, uh, to be able to manage these things cost effectively and to kind of piecemeal the various, you know, DSIM platforms and security and this, that, and the other. So we had to build our own. So we built one that's called Edge OS and, and there's a camera, you know, throughout the entire data center. So, you, you know, you can see, at any one time, you know, your rack, your row, the entire facility, you can see your environmentals. Um, it's important from a compliance perspective. You can put ticketing and all that kind of stuff. So that goes to my earlier point around once you shrink that form factor down and it's not obviously cost effective to man these things, um, but to be able to give the customer the peace of mind that their workload is safe, secure and operating effectively is critical, right? And so that's why we built that. From a managed service perspective in the traditional sense, you know, this is where we partner. We stay true to our knitting, we're a data center operator and so forth. So we partner with Rackspace, hey, if you need help and others, uh, in terms of determining what cloud you want to connect to and how to connect and hybrid and so forth, we we partner with them and or, or a mega port if they're deployed throughout many of our facilities and other partners like them, like Packet Fabric and others, you want the multi-cloud, then we can connect to that. But we focus on our strength and then have best of breed providers to give the customer, you know, bringing the cloud local to them through these uh, these partners that that know it far better than we do. So. Gotcha. And I know that Hugh and, and Doug, uh, one or the other, or both, are go- going to talk about the resiliency is really in the network, and that's where this, you know, the, having 50 to 100 nodes where you can fail over mm-hmm. on the network is so critical. Yeah, yeah, and I, and and just like Greg hit before, um, you know, it, when you build these facilities, you can't get crazy because you have to have the revenue to support the, you know, you have to have payback, right? So, some customers are they just want in, they they, they you know. One line in, we're good, but then you get some customers that want N plus one on everything. So once you start building your facility out of that, now you're at half a million dollars. And you're like, how am I gonna do that with $15,000 a month of max capacity revenue? So you're, it's all about what type of customer is gonna take space there. And then, and then the other thing is you have to keep competitive with the local data center that's in say Atlanta or whatever. So it's not like you can charge more at the edge right now. So. It's, uh, it's, it's all evolving. So. Very good. Do you? Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it, this has been addressed by the other panelists pretty well. Um, uh, managed services, uh, we, we, we go up the stack as required by our customers. We don't, uh, to stick to Philip's well, well-known knitting skills, um, we, um, uh, we try to stick to what we do very well. And, um, but you know, it's, it's funny. It, it, little known facts we had one of the first nfb networks here in the u.s back in 2016 um and not because we were trying to do that but because our customers had asked for it um and you it's amazing what you could do in these small environments uh because you you're not um relegated to a, a much larger uh ubiquitous type of network but in terms of managed services obviously um making making sure that that environment is very secure again i we stick to the co-location um uh, we do have remote hands. Um, I will say that um, a, a lot of your operations, um, uh, if you're at 30 cents on the dollar, um, you, that, that's got to get improved. Um, it's uh, That's a traditional telecom model. Um, there's things that uh, in your design, in your deployment, thing, uh, managed services are great, but my highest walkthrough on a site is the first three months that my customers move in. After that, you don't want to be going in there. Um, unless you're doing maintenance and maintenance typically we start thinking about maintenance and having those expenses occur uh, usually around year two and a half to three where you start doing some mild uh, upgrades um, and those are things that are important um, and um, and uh, but obviously you will have people who want you to go in and, and touch some of their stuff some people don't my enterprises 
uh, they're kind of 50-50. The hyperscalers, you don't touch. Um, telecom, you don't touch. Um, but uh, we do make sure that we have escorts. We do, we've got, uh, in all of our remote sites, we're, we're able to get folks out there um, on a short notice to be able to walk through, again, to maintain, maintain full compliance. Um, uh, and, and again, the real compliance, the SSE, uh, SSAE 18, uh, which is very important. All right, very good. So follow on to that question. Next question has to do with operational challenges. Now we talked a little bit already about things like getting things ready to go, siting issues and things like that. We also said that a lot of these sites need to be in a relative uh, Maytag repairman mode where you know it just sits there and you need to have it be able to operate without any carrying and feeding. Uh, but is it really like that? Aren't there instances in which one needs to do stuff for these edge computing nodes. What are some of the operational challenges? Now that could be from a computer uh, perspective, the, the computing equipment itself, or it could be from the operator's perspective. Uh, I'd like to hear uh, what are the operational issues that happen once you deploy it, who's gonna take care of it, and what do you do to make sure it's operating properly? Greg, we'll let you go start. You, you, you just signed your big deal with your, your uh, maintenance company, so you can, you can talk I, about I, To be honest with you, I, I, think, I think we covered it pretty good um, on, on, with the last question. I, I, I think one thing that needs to be touched on is connectivity, and, and obviously these uh, sites are irrelevant if you don't have good connectivity, right? and, and that's that's a challenge because uh, to get a teleco in the street to build a lateral into our MDC uh, without an order, uh, that's not their general way of doing business, right? Those sales guys need uh, some kind of order to build a business case to go to their outside plant people uh, to, to approve that lateral build. Uh, we are seeing some um, let's say entrepreneurship by some of the regional providers that are talking about building in on spec. But uh, for us, and I think the majority of, of the companies here, uh, the king makers in this are the cable codes, no question about it. The ISPs own the eyeballs on the terrestrial networks. And unless you get a, a collaboration with them and, and being able to get point to point out to those aggregation routers to serve those eyeballs, uh, these these applications are not going to perform the way uh, that our customers are hoping. And so, uh, developing those conversations between the cable codes and the hyperscalers is critical. Believe it or not, those conversations have not taken place. They're just beginning to talk. And you know, us and and I'm sure uh, Hugh and and Doug and Philip. Obviously, his uh, company has, has been financed by the Cable Co., so that relationship is pretty strong with Edge Connect. But uh, for us, it's, it's, it's been a challenge, uh, but we're starting to get some traction there. Yeah, right. that's, that's a good point. Getting connectivity is, a, is one of our challenges. You talk about deployment challenges. You know, just a prime example, we have two sites that, oh my gosh, we've been waiting on Fiverr for almost six months. So it's, you know, they've got to build out, they've got to, you know, like Greg said, they got to have a revenue model that justifies the build out, right? So you're taking a gamble because you got to build that fiber first before the customer will come. So you have to commit to the fiber and then hope the customer comes. So, I mean, the customers are coming, but, you know, it's still a gamble. So you got to build the network out first. Uh, you right. know, talking about connectivity, I'm just going to scoot right in here. Um, and bringing it up to the level of caring, uh, we have an all-star audience here. William B. Norton, um, you guys know him as the co-founder of Econix, and um, also Peering Powerhouse. He wrote the book, uh, The Internet Peering Playbook, of course. Um, but he writes in and he asks a peering question that I think is a nice transition right here as we, as we start to wrap this up. But uh, his question, can carrier neutral edge data centers, small in size by definition, of course, provide enough of a peering population to attract a critical mass of peering to justify the build-in for peering? Well, I'll start, right? So I think it, first off, it's great to hear from 
that Dr. Perrin's listening in. Um, <laughs> That's why I had you answer. <laughs> he, he's the best one to answer that question, right? But look, at the end of the day, you know, I think, again, I revert back to, you know, I, I was at Equinix for a number of years as well, and I, and I live in Ashburn. Um, and, and you see what has resulted as a result of May East and May West, right? And now you're seeing that in a lot of tier two markets. Like you go back 10 years and the volume of traffic flows that are occurring in those markets are are growing at a rapid pace, right? And and so it's just, you know, number of years behind, but this is where that distributed architecture that we've all been talking about and all that we're trying to enable. And so it will definitely go beyond the tier two, tier three markets. I think, but ultimately, as Greg was just talking about, the, the networks are so critical because otherwise they're islands and you have to be able to peer at the edge and you have to uh, enable these traffic flows at the edge. And we're kind of in this flux because the carriers are looking at their central offices as being the, the, the destination to enable this stuff, but it's not carrier neutral. So we're in this kind of chicken and the egg timeline where we got to get over that mindset and the carriers have to get over the mindset to go to a carrier neutral facility, the, the, the micro edge facilities, and that's where the peering should occur. And I do think because of the, the, if you look at all the trends as a collective, that volume of data will be adequate and sufficient to justify peering at the, at the far edge. Yeah, tier tier, is that, I, I, absolutely. Um, this will take a little bit of time to grow. Um, not all peering platforms are equal. Um, uh, not all have the same strategy. Um, we um, in, in our very ultra localized, I won't really call them remote because some of them are not as remote as you think. Um, they do really want to stick to a, a local platform. Um, but uh, again, let's it, it's if if a site is not generating um, the eyeballs, um, then obviously peering is kind of pointless. Um, uh, and eyeballs can be anything. It's not just wireless subscribers. I mean, there can be many different types of eyeballs that are out there. Uh, you'd be amazed at how a, a very large enterprise will attract attention. Uh, but yes, absolutely growing these, uh, making sure that you're using the right partners, making sure that it's these are not just completely exclusive, um, and, and making sure you, you're also, um, you're listening to the local flavor. That's a huge issue. If you come in and you bring in um, a, a very large international IX into uh, rural America, um, and I do at this point mean rural, um, it, 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 yes, it's, it might have a, you know, thousands of ASNs, and that's fantastic, but it's not really going to get done what you need to get done. It can actually, in some ways, overwhelm it. Um, and uh, but we are seeing that, and this is something that is it, it's got to be a must in your strategy, um, or um, or you're not actually playing. All right, um, we are tight on time. There's so many other great questions too, uh, which I'll, I'll send around by email. Maybe we'll get some answers uh, by the panelists uh, post post uh, uh, roundtable here. Um, but um, really, I just wanted to say. Huge thank you guys, um, such great insight, um, uh, really such a great panel. Um, you guys have taught us so much. Um, I wanna say a huge thank you to our round table and uh, the amazing um, gentlemen who have voiced their, uh, their thoughts on getting to the edge. Uh, Greg, you taught me far edge. Philip, how you're protecting the internet, Hugh, your digital logistics. Um, and Doug, I, I loved your use case of transportation industry right out of the get-go. Um, mm. So, so much great uh, content coming from this and I appreciate you guys uh, all jumping in um, and, and providing that for us. Also, of course, huge thank you um, to our moderator, who uh, Jerry Christensen, dear friend, who also has a white paper coming out uh, soon. We're gonna tee that up. Uh, so, uh, on, on edge um, and where it's at and where it's heading. So thank you audience for tuning in. It's been a wonderful JSA TV, JSA podcast. Um, go ahead and the recording of it will be available on iTunes, Spotify, uh, YouTube, you name it. And um, please go ahead and check out JSA.net for our upcoming webinars. We definitely want you to um, keep feeding the, 
the hunger for content uh, with our with our lunches with the punch, <laughs> if you will. Um, so go ahead and check out jsa.net for more topics and and ask you know if you have a speaker that would be perfect for some upcoming topics. We want to hear from you. Thank you, everyone. Huge huge appreciation and uh, happy networking. <laughs>